Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome our stakeholders who are tuning in to the audio webcast of this afternoon's FAF Board of Trustees meeting, and also welcome to those of you who are here in Washington, Washington D.C. observing our meeting today in person. Today's meeting will include reports from the FASB Chairman, the GASB Chairman, the FAF President and CEO, and the FAF Treasurer. We'll also receive reports about the latest activities of the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Council and the Governmental Accounting Standards Advisory Council. And finally, we'll also receive a report from the co-chairs of the Board of Trustees Standard Setting Process Oversight Committee. Before we get into the reports, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank FASB member Mark Siegel for his outstanding service. Mark will be retiring from the FASB after serving 10 years on the board. This was an amazing time to be part of standard setting and as the, F as the FASB finalized major standards on revenue recognition, leases, credit losses, and hedging. We also know that there's a special place in Mark's heart dedicated to the FASB's Disclosure Framework Project, which is focused on improving the effectiveness of disclosures in financial statements. Mark helped secure more investor perspectives to the FASB standard setting process and was instrumental in helping the FASB and staff communicate with stakeholders in a more plain English manner. Mark's term concludes at the end of June and we thank him again for his service and look forward to hearing about his next endeavors. I also want to take this opportunity to welcome new FASB member Gary Buser, who will officially join the board on July 1st. Gary has 30 years of experience working in portfolio management, equity research, and accounting analysis, and recently served as a director and research analyst at Lazard Asset Management. At Lazard, he worked as an accounting analyst to improve the firm's global investment professional's understanding of accounting standards, and has worked to help Lazard's investors make better informed investment decisions. Please join me in welcoming Gary. I also want to acknowledge Harold Monk's departure from the FASB. Harold will be stepping down from the FASB on May 31st. And while Harold could not make it today, please join me in thanking him for his service to the FASB. As I mentioned earlier, today's meeting is being held in Washington, D.C. Uh, each year, the trustees travel to Washington, D.C. for our May quarterly meetings. Here we meet with members of Congress and their staffs to share with them the work of our standard-setting boards. We also discuss the importance of high-quality accounting standards to the U.S. capital markets. Maintaining strong relationships and an open dialogue with elected and appointed officials is part of our trustees' responsibility to promote and protect the integrity of the standard-setting process. Earlier today, we had good substantive meetings with a number of members of Congress on issues of mutual interest. Our meetings gave them the chance to tell us what they're hearing from their constituents and gave us the chance to provide them with updates on the key activities underway at the FASB, the GASB, and the FAF. Each year, we look forward to this opportunity to meet face-to-face -face and answer questions. We discuss how the standard-setting boards can better serve investors and other users of financial statements, and we also demonstrate why an independent standard-setting process that engages diverse stakeholder views is critical to developing the highest quality accounting standards possible. With that, I'd like to move to our regular agenda. The first item of business is the approval of the minutes from our February 27th meeting. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to turn now to the report of uh, the Board of Trustees Standard Setting Process Oversight Committee uh, presented by co-chairs Nancy Kopp and Terry Warfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start off. Um, as you know, the, the committee met yesterday, Monday, for a few hours uh, filled with discussion and updating. The chairs of the FASB and the GASB are going to be updating uh, us all uh, in a minute on their, uh, on their accomplishments in the last quarter. So I don't want to step on their, on their feet, but there was one thing regarding the GASB particularly uh, Dave Vogt updated us on the discussions that GASB is having with the Native American Finance Officers Association, or as we know it, uh, NAFOA, about the application of the standards, the GASB standards, uh, to tribal agencies. Um, as we discussed in the last two meetings, actually, of the board, they have been meeting together. There was an educational session uh, two months ago and a decision to establish a working group with broad participation both from 
uh, f from from the GASB, from uh, uh, NAFOA, and from other state and local uh, uh, parties. And the board, uh, through our oversight committee, is going to be keeping in touch on those developments, following uh, uh, them and getting regular reports. So I look forward to uh, to our committee and to. Uh, uh, the gas be keeping the board updated on those developments as they uh, as they go through um, and uh, Terry if you want to sure on the uh, on the FASB side Russ Golden on Monday uh, described the process it's a new process the FASB is following to assess costs incurred to implement new standards As a matter of fact the board has implemented a number of resources uh, through a website and other materials to uh, be aids in implementation processes uh, with respect to new standards. And, and what they're trying to do is to assess costs, implementing standards, both the transition costs and ongoing costs. And then the second part of that process is then to <clears throat> begin to explore and assess benefits of the new standards uh, probably uh, a few years after the effective date. The final thing that Russ uh, uh, got us up to date on was some outreach that is ongoing with respect to the insurance project based on some uh, input uh, that they received from some stakeholders. The second area I wanted to talk about was the uh, discussion of the PCC, mat of the PCC matters uh, first of all, we discussed uh, the PCC meeting that was held in April. Uh, this was the first meeting of the year, so it was the first official meeting for four new PCC members, and, um, and that transition process is going well, um, as, as reported uh, during the meeting. And uh, committee members Chuck Allen and Diane Rubin attended the April meeting. I think Diane was going to provide some observations uh, on the meeting. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, as you mentioned, Trustee Chuck <coughs> Allen and I both attended the two-day meeting of the PCC. Um, the PCC noted several town hall events are planned in the future. On June 12th, there will be a town hall at the NATS, that's the National Advanced Accounting Technical Symposium at that meeting and there will also be an opportunity for the PCC members attending to meet with TIC, the Technical Issues Committee. Um, following that on June 21st there will be a PCC town hall meeting in Montana and then in October, October 26th, the uh, RMA Risk Management Association Conference will be held and the PCC representatives will be meeting with 12 people discussing accounting matters and the reason why this is going to be a special meeting is that this is a user group meeting and we particularly uh, like to have, and the PCC particularly likes to have um, stakeholder feedback from the users. During the meeting there was a good discussion regarding financial performance reporting and disaggregation and a significant amount of time was spent on share-based compensation followed by rec uh, revenue recognition and specifically um, a discussion regarding out-of-pocket expenses, um, which was an issue raised in a letter from the Technical Issues Committee to FASB um, recently. They also discussed VIE expansion for private companies, and following that there was a discussion on cloud computing. Earlier, the PCC had provided comments to the Emerging Issues Task Force for its discussion on cloud computing, and the PCC was very pleased <coughs> that those um, comments were incorporated by EITF in its discussion and, and the end result. Um, I was also particularly interested to see how the group dynamics would change following the um, departure of the last of the founding PCC. PCC members, and while those members were missed, the PCC members filled the gap and had effective and thorough discussions on the issues. Those are my comments. Thank you, Diane. Uh, related to the PCC matters, Sue Cosper and Russ Golden provided their perspectives to the committee 
on the April PCC meeting, I think reinforcing a number of the things that Diane reported on, as well as progress being made by both the PCC and the FASB on projects related to private company stakeholders. Uh, my last item here is we had our uh, twice a year meeting with Candy Wright, who is the PCC chair. And uh, Candy gave us a very good uh, report uh, with respect to how she feels the PCC is working, uh, the engagement of the FASB board members with the PCC, and, uh, and just generally that the uh, PCC process is working well from her perspective. Um, the one thing she wanted to make note of, uh, first, uh, there has been a, a, a conversation percolating up with respect to share-based payment, and uh, they've decided they're going to take a look at that. So that's on their research agenda, um, and, uh, and that will be a topic for discussion uh, going forward. And th then the last point related to the PCC, and this was a broader discussion that we had in the committee, was the importance um, of continued promotion of PCC activities and, uh, and reporting on how the PCC is having an impact uh, on the standard setting process. I think the cloud computing uh, topic that Diane talked about is a good example of that where the PCC provided really good input uh, to the EITF discussion and had an impact on the standard setting. At least that's the feedback they got. Well, that's not something we can march out and show here's a new PCC alternative, but nonetheless, an important activity that the PCC's done. And I think it'll be important that we continue to find the right ways to promote PCC activity and accomplishments uh, so that folks you know, appreciate and uh, acknowledge uh, the, the outcomes of the PCC process. Back to you, Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, just to, to fit in with that, one of the other things we do at the committee meeting is report on, uh, on trustee observations of the, the groups like PCC, the GAS Act, and the FASE Act, the important uh, advisory committees that, that constitute a very important part of, of, of the whole process. And we're going to hear, and we, the uh, committee um, proposed to the board, you might recall at our last meeting, that the board itself meet with the chairs of the advisory committees uh, annually. And so we're going to hear from the chairman of the GAS Act and the FASE Act um, in, in just a moment. But uh, there was a meeting in, uh, in March of the GAS Act that was uh, uh, observed in person by uh, two of our trustees, and I had the pleasure of sitting there listening on the, uh, on the computer for two days. It's much more fun to be there in person. <laughs> but I was really very impressed. I, I do want you to know that the participation of all of the members representing a diversity of views, both preparers and users and academics, um, was really uh, uh, very significant, and the interaction between the staff and uh, the members of the council, I think really very significant and very helpful and part of a total loop that goes to, to making the standards um, n not only as strong as they can be, but then helps in the implementation through education and through, through outreach. Um, and similarly, I think Kathy Casey uh, also observed at the, at the FASE Act uh, meeting and Gary Brubaker, who couldn't be with us today, also. So um, I really do urge the other trustees, even those who are not on the committee, uh, if you have a chance, either in person or, or indirectly through computer and telephone, to, to listen and, and observe and, and let folks know what is happening because the more people understand the process itself, the stronger it, the stronger it is. So I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for participating. Mr. Chairman, if uh, any of our colleagues, Eloise, Kathy, uh, have anything to add? We did have a pretty long discussion at the committee yesterday about it. 
The only thing I would add is, in addition to what Nancy said, is I did go uh, on the first day to the orientation session. They had an orientation session for five new GASEC members and for other members who had joined uh, the council on a mid-year basis. And the orientation session was really a very thorough onboarding uh, process. Uh, there was a full discussion of FAF, there was a full discussion of uh, GASB, the standard setting process, and uh, a full explanation of what their role and responsibilities would be. So I thought for the new people, they walked away at least with some comfort and some understanding of what they were to do. What, they were given a full briefing book, so they were pre prepared to hit the ground running. That's good. Yeah, Nancy, I'll just uh, reinforce your point about the value of sitting in on these meetings. I very much enjoyed sitting in on the meeting in March. I know we hear from the chairman later in terms of his report, but um, the, I, I thought it was very positive. I thought the dynamic uh, on the committee was very constructive. It was extremely um, informative, and um, I know that I learned more about uh, the, the benefit of having the, the variety of views around the table yeah. from the different stakeholders. It was, um, it was very useful. Jeff Esser um, was also at the GASAC well, meeting. I, I was on the phone and I, I went yeah. to the GASB hearing in St. Louis. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's our report. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Any uh, questions for Terry or Nancy? Okay, with that, we're going to turn to uh, Russ Golden and the FASB Chairman's Report. Russ? Thank you and good afternoon. My former report is on master page 73 of your materials. In Section A, I described the uh, final documents that the Board issued in the first <coughs> quarter as well as those that we've issued for public comment. Over the last six weeks, the Board has cleared either for public comment or for final issuance a number of documents, including, as uh, Chuck talked about, uh, Mark Siegel's uh, favorite project disclosure framework and the four projects associated with that. We do expect to issue those documents as others uh, throughout the end of the second quarter and into the third quarter. On June 6th, uh, the staff will be presenting to the board all of the final research associated with our 10-year uh, project on improving the accounting for long-duration insurance um, contracts. And if the board believes they have sufficient information and sufficient research, uh, I will then ask for a final vote, and it most likely will be our final meeting on, on that project. Beginning on master page 74 and into 75, specifically sections B and C, are the various projects that we've added and the various technical conclusions and discussions we've had regarding implementation, which shows uh, continues to show the FASB's commitment to serving our stakeholders through the implementation phases of these major, ma major projects. Um, on master page 80, I talk about the international activities. Throughout the first quarter, a number of us participated in various video conferencing with other standards boards across the world. And uh, Christine and I had the opportunity to go to Japan and attend a multilateral <coughs> meeting and then a bilateral meeting with our colleagues in the Accounting Standards Board of Japan. We're very much looking forward to a public <coughs> joint meeting with our colleagues th at the International Accounting Standards Board, except for June 18th. Uh, all uh, seated board members and Gary will attend that meeting, and we're looking forward to a robust discussion about the implementation activities that uh, we have been conducting uh, that they have been conducting throughout these uh, joint projects, as well as uh, uh, projects that um, are aligned between our two agendas. And I'd be happy to report to you the, the results of that meeting in our August uh, trustees meeting. With that, uh, I'll conclude my prepared remarks and be happy to answer any questions the trustees have. Okay. My other question? So, Russ, I understand that there are some changes in the works regarding Gatsby's staffing. Sure. Why don't I let Why don't I let Sue talk about the, uh, the staffing? So, uh, so thanks, Myra. Um, we have um, we have about a third of our resources that are working on implementation activities, and so there's been a bit of a shift from not only strictly speaking doing project work, but significant implementation activities. That includes things like technical inquiries. That includes transition resource group meetings and materials. It also includes speeches and educational webinars, so a significant en effort there. We have uh, also reduced the number of our fellows, so we've changed a little bit the fellowship program, um, considering uh, in, in align with our agenda, our active projects and our agenda. And one other um, great development, actually, is we are adding an academic fellow who starts with us on July the 9th. 
under Christine Bodison's leadership. Uh, she was able to uh, help us restructure the program and identify a great candidate. I don't know if, Christine, you want to talk about that at all? I would love to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Uh, I'm very pleased that we're going to be having uh, Dr. Kurt Gee join us from Stanford University. He just uh, recently completed his dissertation. And um, he is um, hired as an assistant professor to begin at Penn State University as soon as he's completed his year with us at the, at the board um, on staff. And I think uh, he's going to be a really great resource. I think he, he's going to bring a lot of um, expertise to bear. And um, he's he I, he we're just very excited about him. So I think I think it's going to be a great addition. And I'm I'm very happy that we got this new program off to such a great start. And I have very high hopes for it uh, to continue in this vein. Other questions for Russ? Chuck. So um, Russ, I want to just follow up on a comment that Terry made about the insurance project that we're working on <clears throat> and when I was preparing for the oversight committee meeting I read a comment letter from a couple of stakeholders and in there they referenced a survey that had been done and was wondering if you'd like to comment on that survey and what we intend to do with that uh, data um, sure I did receive that, that comment letter and we, we posted it pursuant to our, our policy um, after reading the comment letter I did invite the um, uh, representatives of those both those organizations that come in and meet with all members of the board and that that took place last week I uh, found it to be a very very productive and, and, and constructive discussion um, and um, I've also asked the staff to go back and 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 um, look at some of the outreach that we have done and I believe I believe the data is approximately 150 users throughout the project um, uh, so we can better understand why there may be uh, or if there is different um, data points and all that will be presented to to the board on on June 6th uh, Mark's really been kind of leading our outreach to investors so if you have anything to add Mark that's the wrong one <laughs> Here you got it okay um, sure well I, I, you know you mentioned this is a 10-year project so it spanned my entire term <laughs> um, so a brief history yeah, you know, I mean, I think the first, the first, the first, we, we've issued four exposure drafts in this area. Like the first one was in uh, an invitation to comment in 2007. And frankly, my recollection is that the industry asked us to get involved at that time uh, in this project, um, particularly since the IASB had been hard at work uh, working on the in, an insurance update for, for IFRS. And so the industry wanted us to be at the table when the uh, IASB was working on it. Um, after that, we issued a, a discussion paper in 2010, uh, another exposure draft in 2013. Um, after that exposure draft, all the feedback that we got was, hey, this joint project is way too broad and had way too much impact on, on, on the industry, for, and we heard that from investors and preparers alike. Um, so we actually completely changed uh, the tune of the project on the basis of the feedback that we got and went instead to a targeted improvements type project where we really tried to tackle a, a smaller number of areas. Um, targeted improve, improvements means we, we sort of had a narrower set in mind of objectives that doesn't mean that there's not going to be an important uh, significant impact. Uh, it just means that we were doing a fewer areas. Uh, and then we put out another exposure <coughs> draft in 2016. Um, and, and so now we're finally uh, getting to the, to the end game of, of all that uh, feedback. And over those 10 years, I think there were about 450 comment letters. Russ said 150 me individual meetings with users, and I think that that's a conservative number that the staff collects. Uh, Hal and I and others have had other meetings that are probably uh, off the books. Um, uh, and, and um, you know, so, so I think that throughout the project, we've been getting a lot of outreach and, and sort of um, – navigating our way through it and, and changing course uh, as a result of some of the feedback that we've gotten over time. Thank you. Any other questions for Terry, for Russ? Uh, Russ, can you just follow up a little bit more? I, you had a high level on the meeting with the ISB, but it, can you give us a little bit more, sing a few more bars on uh, the agenda for that meeting? You want to do it? 
Sue, Sue's been working with their counterpart, Neely Shaw, who, who we've known for a yeah. number of years so about the agenda. We're planning to talk at length about our project on financial performance reporting, uh, primarily because they have a similar project on their agenda uh, called Primary Financial Statements, so we'll spend a lot of time talking about our respective projects and the overlap. In addition, we'll be talking about segment reporting. They have a, a great interest in what we're doing with, with regard to segment reporting in terms of we're looking at aggregation criteria as well as the disclosures, <coughs> associated disclosures. Um, and in addition, uh, our project, we have a research project on goodwill, subsequent accounting for goodwill. Uh, they are also interested in that project, so we will be uh, discussing that project as well. And in addition to that, we have time allotted for implementation efforts with respect to revenue, uh, credit losses um, and leases, um, in addition, just general updates on some of the other projects. So I think it'll be a great meeting. <coughs> Any other, John? Just maybe to follow up with one of the elements on the agenda you talked about, Sue, but or, or Russ, um, you know, now that revenue recognition is effective for most public companies out there, and given the significance of the efforts around that. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what FASB is doing to monitor how implementation is going here as we get right out of the gate? Uh, sure. I, I, think the, I think the process worked, worked really well, and Jim and Sue deserve a lot of credit for, for leading our, um, our implementation effort, the creation of the TRG, uh, really standing ready to help, help with questions. I have, um, and Andy Masters, he'll probably get to it in his prepared remarks, led a great discussion uh, for the board to understand the types of cost and, and, and the current status. We do, we do, uh, we have asked staff to monitor disclosures uh, and monitor uh, any implementation questions. And we do expect that the staff uh, will, will be ready uh, as, as the SEC uh, evaluates companies' uh, implementation and, and, and has any questions uh, through the comment letter process. And of course, if there are additional things that, that the board needs to clarify or the board needs to adjust to reduce the cost, we, we stand ready to, 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 to help and research any, any questions that may come in. Okay, thank you. I'd um, like to move now to um, report of the FASAC Chair, Andy McMaster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my report can be found on master page 89 in your materials. Uh, let me just start by observing that in this March meeting was the one where we welcomed nine new uh, council members. Uh, we had an orientation session followed by an administrative session. The administrative session had 21 members showing up the day before our full meeting, so that was pretty encouraged by that. Uh, the orientation session, I thought, was, was really quite meaningful. I mean, obviously, it covers what you would think of, uh, the FASB priorities, the mission, uh, it, the role of FASAC, its structure, uh, and, and those are primarily conducted by, by Russ and Sue. Uh, and it, it really gives a good baseline for the, the new members. We also got, had a, a very good uh, session in the orientation uh, from uh, Kevin Vaughn from the SEC, uh, which, which I thought was important because it showed the balance and the importance of the relationship between the different bodies. Uh, so that went well. The administrative session was fairly straightforward. We have this every year. We talk about uh, what were the topics that we addressed in the prior year, what is on the agenda for, for FASB, and how that relates to our forward-looking agenda and with a lot of discussion around what that agenda is going to look like. The meeting the next day focused in two areas. The first one, probably not surprising to you, was uh, tax reform and income tax accounting. Uh, and it was, it was, from my perspective, very encouraging. You know, the, the companies were clearly challenged by the date of implementation or the date of effectiveness for that, uh, that legislation. Uh, but they were very complimentary of both the FASB and the SEC in terms of their swift reaction and guidance that they provided FASB in the form of Q&As, SEC in, in the form of an SAB, uh, which really uh, help facilitate uh, preparers being able to uh, respond in a very, very short period of time. So that was, that was positive. The, the members did encourage the board to continue to, to follow up on, on two of the tax provisions that are a little bit more complicated, uh, and quite frankly, most companies did not resolve them at that point in time, BEAT, and uh, what they call guilty. You've got to love the acronyms. Um, they, we did talk about the, the FASB's uh, revisiting and refreshing the Disclosure Review Project and Income Taxes, and they were very supportive of that. There's one area, though, that there was mixed reviews, and that's discussion on backwards tracing. A little bit more complicated, but it's one that will probably, uh, it's a research project that the, the board has, uh, and we'll probably come back and, and talk about that again. 
The second topic, as, as Russ alluded to and you've heard a little bit about, was implementation of revenue recognition. Uh, our, our objective here was really to focus on the initial costs and initial benefits, recognizing it was very early on. Uh, but we wanted to get a quick snapshot at that point in time. Obviously, uh, given the status, the investors didn't weigh in too much because they really hadn't seen disclosures at that point in time. Uh, but from the perspective of practitioners, uh, they said costs were somewhat uh, higher than they had, they had initially expected. However, from a personal perspective and from what some of the other members observed to me, uh, I was actually surprised at, at, that they weren't higher. I, I thought the costs were actually turned out to be lower than I expected for the major preparers that are, that are part of that. Now, just one person's perspective, but there were a couple of others that felt the same way. Uh, some of the benefits that they recognized, and, and this, this I think is quite positive, is that uh, the adoption of the standard is only going to require, in many cases, minimal changes to how they negotiate contracts, which was a great concern to them early on, that it could really affect the business. And, and from that perspective, it hasn't. And it's increased the, uh, both the efficiency and, and the centralized uh, 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 record keeping for contract information, something that you can imagine was not all that, that strong in the past. Uh, as I said before, disclosure from an investor perspective is, is preliminary, uh, but uh, we'll, we will be revisiting this uh, later, and, and, and I think that's important. Uh, they also commented that they think the recurring costs are likely going to be substantially less than the, uh, the initial costs. You would hope that that is the case. Uh, our next meeting is going to be on Friday, June 8th. We have two topics identified. Interestingly, they, they uh, align pretty closely with uh, the, the discussion that the ISB is going to have, or the board is going to have with the ISB. One is the disaggregation of performance information, and the second is uh, taking a, a look at the, the board's research project on goodwill. Uh, so I'll stop there and respond to any questions. Questions for Andy? Kathy? Andy, um, again, I had the pleasure of sitting in on the meeting, and I very much enjoyed it. Very much enjoyed it. With respect to the assessment of costs and benefits, you mentioned uh, that this was sort of the initial effort uh, to do that, and that there might this might be the first in a series of future discussions on cost and benefits of the the implementation of the revenue recognition standard. I wondered if you could mention what you think that means, and also how you might also be looking at these cost and benefits of other standards and, and how that will help the FASB? That's a great question. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that FASAC believes, uh, and you, you've heard the importance of, of implementation monitoring on the part of the, the FASB. Uh, we think of FASAC as being another arm to assist the board in doing that, uh, given the fact that we have a lot of different stakeholders that, that attend these meetings. Uh, so you know, we did identify early on, and it was early on, to take a look at, at RevRec. <laughs> Uh, and I think we got some, some important and meaningful input back that, that hopefully will assist the board in understanding it. We're going to come back at the end of this year, and uh, that may still be a little bit early, but take a look at, at a closer look at the ongoing costs and what are some of the ongoing benefits uh, and, and provide, you know, preparers, uh, auditors, investors uh, the opportunity to comment on that. Uh, but, you know, this is a high priority for both the board and for FASAC. Uh, and, and it, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's a, uh, an approach we intend to use with the other standards that will be implemented, uh, you know, in both leases and CECL in all likelihood. Uh, in fact, for leases, we're going we're gonna to look at that. I, I believe we've got it scheduled for December 2019 uh, to do that initial look for leases as well. Okay. Any other questions for Andy? Andy, thank you. Um, all right. We'd like to turn to the GASB chair report, Dave Vaught. Yes, my uh, report starts on page 93 of your packet, and I'll highlight just a few items from there and then turn it over to questions. But you'll see in item 1A that one final pronouncement was issued. We issued a standard on certain disclosures related to debt, including direct borrowings and, and direct placements. And I will tell you that this topic actually uh, came through our advisory council, the GASAC, and specifically the representatives in the user community. So we were able to respond to that. Second I would point out is that we did uh, clear a document for public comment, which was an invitation to comment on revenue and expense recognition. Um, I will tell you that uh, it's pr presenting two potential 
models for the, the GASB to consider. One that's similar to what we're doing today, exchange and non-exchange, and the other one is performance obligation, no performance obligation, similar to what our sister board, the FASB, did on revenue recognition. So just looking for input from uh, our stakeholders on those two different approaches. Um, I would, we didn't have any changes during the quarter in our agenda, but I did point out in, in item 1C there that we did in April at our board meeting add two projects <coughs> to the current technical agenda, one on public-private partnerships and the other one on cloud computing arrangements. And both of these uh, projects will involve financial information that is clearly uh, within the scope, group one, of the GASB scope of authority. So uh, the other thing I would point out is that we continue to work on significant decisions related to the financial reporting model reexamination. Um, we're working towards the goal of issuing a preliminary views in the third quarter of this year. Um, and that will prove interesting because the ITC, as you know, got a lot of different varying uh, feedback, and now the board will be taking a preliminary <coughs> view, so it will be interesting to get our stakeholder viewpoints on where the board is tentatively headed on that particular project. On page 94, I would just point out on the international scene uh, that myself and, and some of the GASB team met with the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board when they had their meeting in New York City in March, so we were able to participate with their board and interact with them. Um, on page 95, I would just point out that I, in addition to the two projects that we added to our current technical agenda, we did add one topic on uh, research related to deferred compensation plans. Um, so we'll be doing starting some reach on, research on that. And that's primarily because the two projects that we moved to, the technical plan, came from the pre-agenda research when the research was completed. So. Um, the last thing I would simply point out to you is on the last page of my report, which is on page 99, and just point out that we continue to monitor the implementation on the pension standards, uh, gathering the data <coughs> currently on how that implementation is going, which will be very beneficial when it comes to the post-implementation review of those standards. So with that, uh, Chairman, I'll turn it back to you for any questions. Thanks, Dave. Any questions for Dave? Gene? Uh, Dave, thanks for the report. Um, got a question for uh, either you or Jeff. Um, as you continue this push for uh, making the financial statements uh, high readability, usability, and I applaud that, uh, I noticed that you mentioned in the report uh, under the strategic section, you've got an analyst guide to government financial statements. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Who are you targeting with that guide and, and how are you hoping to um, help to service uh, your uh, constituents with that? I'll have Jeff, our GASB Vice Chair, answer that question since he brings the perspective of the user to the table. Sure. Well, we, um, we updated uh, actually our most basic user guide recently, and that's the one designed for citizens and legislative groups and, uh, and oversight bodies. And then more recent to that, we updated the analyst guide, which um, from my background as an analyst is a, is a pretty useful thing, and that's one step up in complexity. And I sort of see these guides sort of playing three, three functions, particularly the analyst guide. One is it's, it's a link between governmental accounting and governmental analysis. Um, most analysts are not accountants. And so to have governmental accounting in a language they understand, um, I think is very, very useful to them. And now seeing as I've been in both seats, uh, I see that linkage quite clearly. Um, second is uh, with the advent of automation, more and more analysts are not necessarily digging into the financial statements themselves, but are having financial <coughs> statement information given to them. And so guides such as this, I think, are helpful to have analysts oversee <coughs> that, that collection of data. Um, and finally is, and I've seen this in some of my outreach, the value for junior analysts. You know, the shortage of governmental accounting expertise that exists within governments and also auditors is also in the analytic community. So guides such as this really help bridge that gap over to knowledge about governmental accounting and GASB standards. One follow-on question, if I can. And you'll be updating this at what, what frequency? 
We generally, this is the third edition, so generally every two, three years, and, and really I think based on major standards, on major standards, standards coming out. Yeah, major standard to, so to this one picked up pensions and, 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 OPEB. and OPEB, so that's pretty significant changes, therefore warranting an updated analyst guide. Thank you. Jeff? Yes, uh, uh, Dave, you mentioned in your written report a number of speeches and presentations that you've made during the reporting period. Can you kind of tell us why those are important and, and how they uh, affect your stakeholder outreach? Yeah, no, uh, definitely speeches and stuff are very, very important. And uh, <coughs> Dave Bean helps coordinate a lot of it. Um, he and I do a lot of the presentations, but a lot of our team does too. So I'll have David come in a little bit on that. Okay, Jeff. Um, you, you talked about outreach efforts, and, and really speeches are, are a key part of the outreach efforts in fulfilling our, our mission, the education portion of our mission. It, I think it's really beneficial for our stakeholders to, to hear it from the horse's mouth, you know, to, to actually hear it from the, the standard setters um, who have been through the wars of developing the standards because people not only want to know the what, but they also want to know the whys. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to get direct feedback uh, from our stakeholders. Um, there are many issues that have come up over the years where we've picked up through conversations, either Q&As during the presentations, it um, could be even informal conversations, uh, for example, uh, you know, during a break or at a meal, where somebody will raise an issue, it will spark, you know, say this, this has broader implications and we'll bring that to our advisory council, talk to them, and, um, and in many cases it has resulted in a uh, practice issue project and, and a final standard. Then I think the final thing is it, it helps humanize the board. You know, they, uh, they think we're... Uh, we're Martians. Yes. They think we're some uh, authoritarian body that doesn't care. And uh, by, by seeing us in the flesh and, and, and being able to interact with us, they, they find out that we've actually walked a mile in their shoes, either as a preparer or an auditor or a user of financial statements. And I think that helps tremendously in, uh, you know, the board in our outreach efforts and, and, um, and making sure that we're inclusive in in the uh, feedback that we get and they feel like we're more approachable because of those presentations. So it, um, it's, it's well, it takes a lot of time, but I think it's, it's well worth our efforts. It's interesting, Jeff, because I mentioned you uh, attending the Government Finance Officers Association Annual Conference. I was able to sit in in some sessions, and it was always interesting as somebody sat down by me and they said, oh, no, that's the Gatsby. <laughs> and that, you know, like we were something different. <laughs> and so it's nice to be able to have those informal conversations with people to, to get their feedback and stuff. And it's a really good way to learn things and to, to build relationships with people. Thank you. Any other questions for Dave or Dave? Uh, but first Always? I, I would just indicate that I went to one of the sessions where David was the speaker and I told him I'd come in the ten. I thought I was walk going to walk into a room of about 15 people. <laughs> I walked into a room of about 1,000 people. Uh, 2,500. 2,500, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but my question, Dave, is you, uh, re you indicated that you had recently issued an invitation um, to comment on the revenue and expense recognition model. Can you just share with us uh, some of the education, some of the outreach efforts that surrounded that whole invitation to comment? Yeah, this being a little bit higher level type document, uh, we wanted to make sure that people understood and gave us feedback because always in this first stage of due process, the more input we get, the more that it can impact where we're headed. So uh, we did do a plain language document about the ITC so people could get a better perspective of what it was about. Um, we've actually put together a five series short video um, where I participated and team members participated talking about this, uh, the invitation to comment. We received about 55 <coughs> comment letters, um, always would like more, but it was still pretty good response rate for this type of document. We also held a webinar to actually cover the invitation to comment so people didn't feel like they had to pick it up and start on their own. And we actually had over 900 participants on that webinar and stuff. In addition, we've been doing public hearings. Uh, we completed two of those public hearings so far. The first one was in St. Louis in conjunction with the Government Finance Officers Association Annual Conference. Uh, last week we just did one in San Francisco and we have one more scheduled in Norwalk next week in conjunction with our annual meeting. So a lot of outreach, a lot of trying to get people to understand and the more feedback we get is the, the better. So we're pleased with the way it's proceeding so far. 
Great. Any other questions for Dave? Okay, thank you, Dave. We'd like to move now to the uh, to Robert Scott and the report of the Gas Act Chair. Robert? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. My written report starts on Master Page 102 of your packet. Uh, as indicated before or earlier, the Gas Act did meet uh, March 5th and 6th in Norwalk. We uh, welcome five new members to the Council at that meeting, and we were also fortunate to uh, in, have in person Trustee Foster and uh, FAF CEO Terry Poley join us. As Trustee Foster noted, we did have a comprehensive orientation session for the five new members, uh, plus those who were appointed by the trustees during 2017 to fill terms. Uh, and that orientation included not only uh, included Terry on behalf of the FAF, but the Daves, myself, and then the Gasby staff, uh, a full morning of, of orientation for the, the new members. Uh, the uh, council provided at the uh, uh, March meeting feedback to the board on several technical agenda items which are noted in the report. I'll highlight uh, three of them in particular. Uh, the first was on the financial reporting model. Um, th we provided feedback specifically on the board's tentative decisions relative to the proposed recognition approach for governmental funds and the short-term financial resources approach which is expected to be included in the next due process document which will be a preliminary views document to be released by the board. The second item that I wanted to highlight was feedback on the implementation guides that are being prepared relative to fiduciary activities and the leases project. These are two very important standards that governments will have to prepare to implement over the next two years. And I think it was very important at this stage of the ga game for the council members to provide feedback on the topics that the staff has accumulated as well as suggesting additional potential questions that could be raised in the implementation guides uh, for preparers to, to ponder as they uh, prepare to implement those standards. And then the third item uh, that I wanted to highlight that we the council provided input on was the final stages of the debt disclosures, including direct borrowing. Uh, that then has since been issued as statement number 88, but it was good that we had that last kick at the cat at that on something that is very important in terms of providing enhanced disclosure for uh, the financial markets in terms of debt disclosures, given the feedback that particularly our user members uh, of the council as well as other users uh, have provided to the, to the council and the board. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other significant activity that occurred besides just commenting on various technical agenda uh, issues was the annual project prioritization uh, where there were 48 potential projects. Uh, it's about a 100-page report that the staff prepares for the council to review uh, in terms of potential projects or pre-agenda research that the board may want to undertake. And so we were able to go through that exercise in, in good order. And uh, I, I'm hoping, I trust that the feedback we provided to the board and the staff will be uh, valuable as we move forward. From an administrative standpoint, <clears throat> uh, the executive committee of the council began the process or agreed to begin the process of develop developing a proposal to update our rules of procedure, which are getting very dusty uh, 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 on top. And, and I think the binder on them is probably coming off the cover of the book. Uh, but we'll discuss in July at the executive committee and then move on to the full council and then eventually the oversight committee and the, and the full board. Um, as Trustee Kopp uh, suggested, uh, we do have our upcoming meeting in July uh, in New York City. And again, we would encourage uh, any of your participation as your schedules may permit and we'd welcome and we'd be glad to see you there and uh, observe our, our, our discussions as I think we, we do have a good discussion as Nancy indicates uh, and as, as emphasized and we'd appreciate uh, your participation and uh, Mr. Chairman I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, questions for Robert? Uh, I have one. I Please. Think Brief question. You, you mentioned in the last bullet the mm -hmm. prioritization of projects, mm -hmm. of GASI projects that the council undertakes. Could mm -hmm. you just touch briefly on the process and then the results? Certainly. Um, as indicated, the, the staff prepares a, a report of various items that could be prepared, including reexamination of, of previously issued standards, um, other items or other topics that have come to the staff or the board's attention or have come to uh, come up through conversations from council members. And so there were a total of 48 items. The process is basically there's a forced ranking that the council members 
uh, make a cho choices in terms of what are high and medium priorities. It's not a, a vote. It's more of a preference uh, uh, ranking process. And as a result of that, uh, there were um, actually six items. To, we had a tie for number five. <laughs> uh, but not surprisingly, they also dovetail with what, where the board's going because the top six items were no disclosures, going concern, information technology, including co cloud computing, public-private partnerships, capital assets, and deferred compensation plans. And all of those other than the capital assets topic you'll note in Chairman Vout's report are either on the pre-agenda research list or they've been added to the technical agenda. So I think that that's, that's illustrative of how the board is listening to its advisory council and putting items onto its, on its agenda. And we appreciate that they, uh, that they are listening. That's good. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, let's turn to uh, the FAF President CEO report. Terry. Thank you, Chuck. Um, just a couple things to mention. One, on the 2018 uh, FAF budget, I wanted to just mention that on April 9th, the SEC completed its review of the FASB accounting support fee and, and posted um, their order regarding review of that fee for 2018. Uh, they review it under Section 109 of Sarbanes-Oxley to ensure that the accounting support fee has been calculated in accordance uh, with that law. Um, shortly thereafter, the PCAOB and FINRA, who are our agents um, for the FASB and GASB accounting support fees, uh, respectively, started the assessment and collection <laughs> process um, for those accounting support fees. I uh, just want to mention that information about how we're funded is available on the website, uh, including a video that we had issued in January. And also, um, for interested stakeholders, a summary copy of our budget is also available on our website. Uh, I mentioned last quarter that we completed an assessment of our publishing technology, um, which confirmed the critical need for us to update our publishing systems and, and some of our business processes. In the interim, we have been um, diving in and doing a little bit of homework to try to, to, to further refine uh, what it is we're going to need to do. We are in the process of um, talking with various vendors um, and expect to refine a project budget and a timeline and come back to the Board of Trustees for approval of that project. And similar to the technology transformation project that we completed last year, we're expecting this to also be a, a multi-year project, but more to come on that. Um, later today, we should be issuing the FAF 2017 annual report. Um, we actually completed the audit, I think, early in, in March and posted the financial statements um, to our website. But this will be the, the beautiful glossy report that will be available. The theme of it is standards that work, and it talks about the efforts that the FASB and the GASB take to ensure that standards work for everyone, including the role that our stakeholders have in that process. Um, there are a number of graphics in the hard copy report, but I would um, encourage people to access the, the online version because there are a few enhanced um, features there and a couple of videos that elaborate further on that theme. Finally, I just would like to say um, that the, the DC meeting is always a, a more challenging one to, to plan and execute uh, with the stakeholder dinner and the Hill visit. So I just wanted to express thanks to Matt Broder and his team, especially Todd Cranford and Cherry Thomas for all the, um, the efforts that um, went into planning and executing uh, these last uh, three days of meetings. Um, thanks to you guys. And that's all I have. Thank you, Terry. Any questions for Terry? All right, let's uh, turn to the report of the FAF Treasurer, Chris. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, um, we did make one accounting change in our, um, in our financial reports, starting with the first quarter of this year, and that is to book all of the accounting support fees in the first quarter rather than uh, breaking them out over the four quarters. So just keep that in the back of your mind as I give you uh, some of these numbers. Um, the total revenue uh, booked in the first quarter was $40.9 million. Uh, that's because of the full accounting support fees being in there. Uh, if I had to uh, you know, do a <laughs> guesstimate, I think we're running just modestly higher than last year on both publications 
and on accounting support fees, which are, you know, really the county support fees are the bulk of our revenues. Uh, second, our total expense is 11.6 uh, million in the first quarter, and that reflects, uh, you know, favorably against the budget. That's the result, mainly of timing, not an expectation that we won't be spending those funds. But there are people who have been hired but won't start until this quarter, and we have a relocation that was expected in the first quarter but will actually be made in the second quarter, and those account for most of the change. Uh, on the investment account, if you recall, the first quarter was a rough one for markets just generally. And so we essentially earned nothing in the first quarter uh, as uh, things uh, declined in value. And that was put us well below our budget. Nonetheless, as we look overall at uh, expense uh, and uh, revenue and investment, we are running a little ahead of our budget. And so as a result, our net assets are uh, increased by 29.2. Uh, again, a huge part of that is the accounting support fee, but uh, nonetheless above uh, what we expected on the budget. Uh, staffing for the, uh, for the three organizations, FAF, FASB, and GASB, is running about five down. Again, that is uh, from budget. That's, again, reflecting the people who have not yet quite joined us. Um, and uh, that really concludes my report. Thanks, Chris. Any questions on the financial report? OK. Uh, before we close, I would be remiss if we didn't uh, really properly recognize uh, Mark Siegel and his contributions to the organization. So Mark uh, and the committee and the committees and the uh, Board of Trustees, please join me in uh, wishing Mark well and thanking him again for a uh, tremendous 10 years. Okay, uh, this concludes the public session of the FAF Board of Trustees meeting. <coughs> I want to thank those of you who have participated in the meeting, uh, those who have tuned into the audio webcast, or those who observed the meeting here in person. Uh, I'd like to close with a reminder that the next FAF Board of Trustees meeting will be held on Tuesday, August 21st in New York City. Thanks very much.